Chapter 7 You've been very quiet today, Holly commented as she watched Molson slump on her couch. He had come in about half an hour ago, telling her he did not want to interrupt her work, then laid on her couch. For a while she had thought he was taking a cat nap. Maybe he had. Now he was staring at her ceiling. I just want to be near you, Molson said softly. Concerned, Holly took off her reading glasses, rising from the desk. She squeezed herself to sit beside Molson on the couch and took his hand. What's going on? He shook his head, not wanting to talk about it. Gazing up at her, he played with her hand, gently massaging it. I think you're the most beautiful person I've ever seen in this world. Beauty fades, she gently told him. Not for you, Molson quietly insisted. You'll be beautiful when you're old, gray, and have one of those ugly tight perms. Holly laughed. Tight perms? Yeah, it seems to be a requirement. Molson had a part smile. Though why you would want to cut off your hair, I don't know. It's beautiful like you. Thank you. Holly was pleased with the compliment. Do you ever think of getting old? He suddenly asked. Wonder who you're going to be with? If you'll have kids, who will die first? The die first seems a bit morbid, Holly pointed out. If we grew old together, I want to die first, decided Molson. I don't want to live those many years with you than suddenly have to do without. I'd just be more in love with you each year until you went first. Life would be miserable. Wow, Holly's breath hitched. It was an oddly romantic thing to say. Do you think it's strange to think that people could fall in love so soon? He studied her. Maybe. I don't know. Holly wasn't certain at what he was driving at. Was he saying that he loved her? It would be very quick. If any of her clients came to her saying they were in love this fast, she would counsel them to be cautious. Now she was on tender hooks, hoping that he did love her. Do you want kids? questioned Molson. Someday. Holly was not too worried yet. She figured she had time since she was barely past her mid-twenties. Two or three. I didn't like being an only child. I think where possible it's good to have siblings. Sometimes it is, frowned Molson. Maybe if they're closer in age. Jan and Drew seem to get on better than I do with them. Tell me about your brother and sister. Holly had a notion this might be where Molson's somber mood was coming from. Jana has three kids. She's married to Miguel. They're both cops, Molson recited easily. She's the oldest and mostly took care of Drew and me. She took care of you? Where were your parents? Holly questioned slowly. Ma's not the greatest. She got a host of mental health issues. Molson heaved a sigh. Pop left before I was born, as I mentioned before, so Jana did the best she could. It's made her bossy. Holly reached out to smooth the hair over his brow. She probably feels like you're one of her kids, and that gives her the right to tell you what to do. She loves you. She has a funny way of showing it, muttered Molson. You've met Drew. He's okay in his own way. Something happened between you and Jana recently, Holly guessed. I don't want to talk about it, Molson repeated. He took her hand, kissing her palm. When you do want to talk, will you talk to me? she asked. Yeah, Molson agreed to her request. How many children do you want? she returned the question to him. I like kids, he told her. As many kids as you'll let us have, so I guess that's two or three. Holly tried not to smile. You're that certain, are you? Certain that if I had the money in my bank account for a proper ring, I'd put one on you, he responded soberly. Molson. Holly did not know what to say. Too fast, huh? Molson had a self-depreciating smile. I got time. All the time that you need. I ain't going nowhere. You don't have any doubts. She could hardly believe it. He nodded. A few. Mostly about how I'm probably not good enough for you. How you might come to regret ever tying yourself to me. I wouldn't do that, Molson. She protested. When you came with me and helped hand out the soup to all those people, I knew. Molson shrugged, still playing with her hand, gently drawing his fingers over her skin. 
I could see a future with you. Holly smiled. You mean you just want me to be a pack mule for you forever? He had a sloppy smile, even though it did not reach his eyes. You found me out. I'm glad. Holly leaned down to give him a kiss. That day made me think of a possible future with you. It did? Molson looked at her with interest. Yes. Holly traced a finger down his cheek. I'm not quite at a ring moment, yet I'm thinking we need more dates. That we can do. His eye caught her watch. An annoyed look flitted across his face. Is your watch on time? Yes. Why? Holly frowned. Molson sighed. I need to get going. I have to check on Ma before going to work. Before you go, have you had much luck convincing the gang leaders to testify? Holly asked curiously. Did Huss get back to you? Huss has decided he's willing under certain conditions, Molson told her. Conditions which I'm not sure we can ever fulfill. Delat says he'll do it, only as a payment for my helping his sister. Yolan is on the fence. He's waiting to see what happens. The others won't even talk to me. Is two of them testifying enough? wondered Holly. Agent Kepler said it was all or nothing, Molson grimaced. He also needs proof of Agent Law tampering with Michael's case. Without those two things, we got nothing. Molson came into the kitchen, tossing his keys on the table. He investigated the fridge, foraging for something to eat. Normally, he knew better than to look for something edible in the house, unless he had brought it through the door with him. There was a Tupperware container growing some sort of mold. The lone egg in the door was blue. Grimacing, Molson grabbed the container of mold and carefully handled the egg. The oval was a ticking time bomb, and he was glad it had not gone off in the fridge. Heading out the back door, he dropped the egg in the container over the fence into the neighboring yard. Ma! Molson yelled into the empty house as he came back in. Ma, you home? Just because Margot did not answer did not mean she was not home. Sometimes she did not hear him because she was sleeping. Sometimes she was in her own little world. Molson was still hungry, so he went to check in a cupboard. Maybe he would get lucky, and there would be something better there. Pulling out a box of cereal, he opened the top, crunching on the sugary, dry, stale bites when he paused. His keys were not on the table anymore. There was a single light on in the living room. Molson put down the box of cereal, the hairs on the back of his neck standing up. The house was eerily quiet, and suddenly contained a vibe that was uneasy, even a little threatening. Putting his hand in his pocket, Molson wrapped his fingers around the jackknife he always carried before approaching the living room. Welcome home, said a man as he sat in the beat-up armchair beneath the lamp. He was gently tossing a set of keys in one hand. The decor could use something. Molson knew he was referring to the holes in the walls. Molson casually leaned against the door jamb of the room. My old lady sometimes hears the roaches in the wall. She likes to liberate them. That was not all Margot heard, but Molson did not feel the need to elaborate. He did a quick tally of what he could see of the man's tattoos. This man was a high-standing member of the gang. They told me you were funny, he chuckled as he leaned back comfortably. We should get down to business. By all means, Molson agreed easily. He kept his body purposely relaxed, even though he felt the tension within him build. I hear you've been talking to each of the kings, the man began his voice soft as a snake and just as deadly, to ask them to rat out a major source of powder. I have, Molson confirmed. He wondered how many other people were in the house, or if it was just him and this man. See, that is a shame. He set the keys down the little end table and picked up a glass, swirling its contents. I don't like rats. Molson recognized the glass from one of the cupboard of the small liquor cabinet his mother kept. This guy had enough time to make himself at home, and Molson was not amused. He did not like the idea of a gang member in his mother's house. 
I don't much like them either, but when part of the tree is diseased, you need to cut it off. The man took a sip from the glass. Explain. David Ramsley is unpredictable. He's old. Molson laid out his argument calmly, as if his very life was not on the line. His role in all this is over. He's never going to be a significant source of powder again. The FBI is going to be watching him. The NYPD are going to be watching him. He's done. He is still powerful and influential, the man reminded Molson. He rolled on his oldest son. He has no loyalty to anyone but himself, Molson stated flatly. If it suits him, he'll roll on each of the kings. You think we should roll on him first? The man had a sardonic smile. Tremblay. Molson thought in sudden comprehension. The mightiest king himself is sitting in my mother's living room. You must think it has merit, otherwise you wouldn't be here, Molson ventured carefully. I think it will create a power vacuum that only one of the kings will fill. One of us will rise. I enjoy getting promotions. Tremblay looked shrewdly at Molson. I want to know why you went to the others and haven't come to me. First, because if I couldn't get their unanimous consent to the plan, then there was no point in coming to you. I wasn't about to waste your time, explained Molson. Second, because I have no leverage with you. Three out of the six are interested. If you can fulfill your end. Tremblay took a sip of liquor before setting the glass down. I have my doubts that you can. I'll get it done, Molson vowed. He hoped Drew could convince Law's superior to give them what they needed to make this happen. I can make it a unanimous six, Tremblay told him. Molson knew that this man had the influence to do so. He also knew that while Tremblay might be greedy for David's position, that was not the only thing he was after. Tremblay was a bargainer. He only did what was best for him. What do you want in return? Tremblay shrugged, pretending to think about it. A simple favor. Favors were never simple, especially unnamed ones, nor did they ever seem to be finished. Molson would be stepping into a world that everyone thought he was already in, but had never actually set foot in. He would be owing the largest king. When Tremblay asked for the favor, which would no doubt be illegal, he would have to fulfill it or face dire consequences heaped on his family and friends. Despite what everyone thought of him, Molson had not done anything illegal since he was a teen and had half-heartedly vandalized some walls with graffiti with a friend. He was not a gangbanger. He was tolerated by the gangs because he was beneficial in his own way, but that was it. If he did this, he would be chained to Tremblay's whim. If he didn't do this, David would remain free, and Michael would remain imprisoned. Molson could not let that happen. I don't have all night. Tremblay stood up. He walked to within a couple feet of Molson, looking him in the eyes. Do we have an understanding? Knowing that he was going to regret it for the rest of his life, Molson nodded. We do. Tremblay smiled. Good. You do your part, and I will do mine. Molson hoped Drew would be able to come through. Either way, he knew Tremblay would collect. Molson used his key on Drew's apartment, entering without knocking, and went straight to the kitchen even though he was not very hungry. Coffee. That was what he needed. A strong, black, bracing cup of coffee that would burn the tongue and the stomach. Molson flicked on the stove light and proceeded to get the percolator running. I am going to change my locks, Drew complained as he joined Molson in the kitchen. It is three in the morning. Yep, Molson agreed. It was early. He pulled out two mugs, setting them on the counter. I have to work at six, hinted Drew. You think you might want to make coffee at Ma's house? Can't, 
Molson sighed as he leaned against the counter, listening to the steady dripping of the coffee. It smelled good. He had forgotten how tired he was. Coffee would lift him out of his fatigue. I needed to talk to you. Why not wait until I got up for work? Drew rubbed his eyes, trying to wake up. He sat at the kitchen table. I thought you might want to know what was happening, Molson looked down at his brother. They were so alike and so different in so many ways. I can put David in jail and get Michael out. Drew stilled before looking at Molson in surprise. They're going to testify? These guys are really going to do it? Yep. Molson could hardly believe that he had managed it. Tremblay is going to push the other five to testify along with himself. Tremblay, stepping into a courtroom. Drew shook his head at the idea. How am I supposed to get him immunity? I've been talking to Agent Kepler, and while he is interested, he's reluctant. Why won't he do it? Molson poured the coffee, giving Drew a mug as he took a seat at the table with him. What does he want? He wants more proof that law is crooked, Drew responded, grimacing at the taste of the true strong coffee. Apparently, he does not like the guy much either. What about the extra money? questioned Molson. The payments to Law's bank account that no one can explain? Sterling's source was not able to confirm that the money comes from David. Drew was regretful. It's all run through a bunch of offshore accounts. We can see Law got a payoff, but not from whom. What else do we have on him? Molson wanted to know. Nothing. Drew shrugged. Kepler says if we can find something, he'll reopen the case and give immunity to your gang buddies. They ain't my gang buddies, muttered Molson. What do they want in return? Drew asked as he shrewdly watched Molson. Don't tell me they're doing it out of the kindness of their hearts. I don't know, Molson said truthfully. What do you mean you don't know? scowled Drew. What is the deal? Molson sighed. Three out of four are out of obligations. I don't owe them anything. The others, Tremblay took care of it. He can make them show. What does Tremblay want in return, Molson? Drew repeated his question sharply. I don't know. At Drew's angry look, Molson elaborated. A favor. I owe Tremblay a favor. Drew breathed in with a hiss. I could be anything. Who knows what he'll ask you to do? I know. Molson didn't need the lecture. He knew it was not good. It's going to be illegal, growled Drew. Might even involve me or Jana, maybe the rest of the Ramsey family. I know, Molson concentrated on the hard, bitter coffee. He hated it when Drew got on his high horse. What a brainless thing for you to do. You could end up in prison or dead, Drew practically shouted at him. His voice was so angry and forceful. I know, Molson yelled back. You don't think I don't know it? You think I just thought he was going to ask me to buy him some lollipops, write his homework, or ask a girl out for him? This ain't fifth grade. I know who Tremblay is and what he's capable of. He could ask you to kill someone, Drew pointed out. Are you ready to do that? I gotta be. Molson was not ready for that. He desperately hoped that he would not be told to hurt anyone. If I don't fill my end of the bargain, he'll come after you, Bethany, Jana, Miguel, the kids. I gotta do whatever he says when the time comes. Who is Tremblay, and why would he want to hurt us? Bethany asked as she put a robe on, padding over to the kitchen table. He's not going to hurt you. Molson did his best to calm down. He did not want to upset Bethany. I'm not going to let that happen. I am beginning to understand why Jana does not want you near her family anymore, Drew seriously remarked. Molson snapped his head back, reeling from the verbal punch that Drew had just thrown. He doesn't mean that, Bethany said gently as she grabbed coffee and sat down. She took one sip, made a face, and added more cream and sugar. Doesn't he? Molson asked, staring at Drew. He sounds serious to me. Drew took Bethany's hand in his. Your actions could potentially harm my wife. You're not married yet, Molson automatically corrected Drew. We will be, responded Drew. I am not going to let you endanger her. You're going to kick me out of your life, Molson said flatly. His stomach clenched. 
he pushed aside his cup of coffee, certain he could not drink another mouthful. No, he is not, Bethany sought to diffuse the situation. Your family. You'll always be in each other's lives. Tell that to Jana, Molson said bitterly. She just wants to protect her kids, replied Drew. A valid point. Stop it, Bethany told them both firmly. That is enough. Molson stood up. Just do what you need to do to get Tremblay and his goons immunity when they testify. Tremblay already knew what he wanted from you when he made the deal, Drew said tiredly. Whatever it is, he has the favor you owe him figured out. He's just stringing you along till he reveals it. Molson knew that. He laid a hand on Bethany's shoulders. Be good to him even if he's an imbecile some days. Molson, come back, Bethany pleaded as he walked out the door. He waited a moment in the corridor, leaning against the wall. No one followed him. More importantly, Drew did not follow him. Molson looked at the keys he had palmed as he had entered the apartment. It would probably take a couple of hours before Drew noticed Molson had swiped his motorcycle again. Molson figured he might as well get one last ride before Drew threw him out of his life forever. Ignoring the hollow feeling in his heart, Molson took the stairs. Riding the motorcycle, it did not take long to get back to Margot's house. He pulled the bike to the back of the driveway, knowing that it was not a great neighborhood, and Drew would have his hide if the motorcycle got stolen. The back door was open, and there was cereal strewn across the backyard. Sighing, Molson went inside. Ma, you done feeding the ducks by the pond? Sometimes, Margot thought she saw ducks in a pond in the backyard. Sometimes she thought she was Mrs. Ramsley and insisted that everyone take her shopping. Other times, Margot baked the most disgusting things with whatever she had in the house. When he was a kid, Molson had eaten Frutio's banana loaf with mustard jelly. That particular cooking experiment had not been half bad. Then again, Molson had been starving as a kid, so any food was good. Whatever she was up to now, Molson was too tired to deal with it. He wished she would just take her medications on time. No matter how often he tried to force her to take them, Margot always seemed to get away with not having them. She was an expert at not taking her pills, hiding them, flushing them, throwing them up. Ma! Molson smelled gas. He went to the stove, making sure the dials were off. It was his secret fear that some day she would burn down the house with her in it. Ma, where are you? A noise from the basement caught his attention. His mother hated the basement. She would never go down there, saying it was too full of rats and too dark. It was an old cellar-type basement with a damp dirt floor and crumbling foundations showing the age of the house. There were boxes down there from some bygone era, thickly coated with dust. Molson was not a fan of the basement, either. Another bang emanated from below. Gritting his teeth, Molson opened a window to get some air moving. He gave himself a small pep talk before descending the stairs. Suck it up, Colburn. A single light bulb shed little light on the situation. In his mind, Molson remembered that there should have been three lights working down here. He stumbled down the last step, eyes watering, pulling the top of his shirt over his mouth. It smelled strongly of gas. Ma? Molson asked as he saw a movement near the back of the cellar. He wove his way through the boxes, some of the stacks leaning precariously. Ma, where are you? Don't worry, Margaret shouted with wild eyes in her dirty face. I will get us out of here. Wait! Molson lunged forward as she swung an axe through the air at the wall, hitting it off the bricks, chipping away at the stone. She had a sizable hole in the wall already started. During her second swing, Molson was able to grab the axe, wrestling with her over it. Ma, let go! We need to escape, she shrieked at him. There was a tornado and we have been buried alive! Curse the weather network. She had seen some pictures of some other state being beat up by Mother Nature, and now she thought the house had collapsed on top of her. I know how to get out. Molson tried to bring his words down to a more calming level. Margot did not respond well to pressure. 
The gas was giving him a splitting headache. The rescue guys are here. I can bring you to them. Really? Margot stopped fighting him over the axe. She panted as they both held on to the wooden handle. Yes. Here, hold on to the axe with me, and I'll lead you to the rescue guys. Molson started to slowly back up around the boxes. He looked up, noticing that one of the light bulbs had been shattered. The lights were on. That meant electricity was still running to that socket. Molson swallowed hard and gave a quick prayer not to die today. Come on, Ma, just a few more steps. I'm Margaret, she introduced herself. Are you one of those firemen come to save me? Sure, Molson gave her a half-hearted smile. Let's go up the steps. I didn't know firemen were so cute. Margot tittered and patted his hand. Don't tell my husband I said that. He'll get jealous. Your secret is safe with me, he promised. Molson knew that when Margot retreated into her younger self, she always referred to David Ramsley as her husband. It was annoying because Molson had never seen one bit of evidence that his parents had ever been married. Just another one of Margot's many delusions. They were almost up the stairs. Molson carefully took Margot's hands off the axe and laid it on the counter before bringing her outside. Let's go look at the stars. The stars, Margot sighed in delight. How did you know I like the stars? Just a hunch. Molson remembered her dragging them as kids to the city park many winter nights in search of stars. Jana had gotten frostbite once. He pulled his cell phone out of his pocket and dialed 911, grateful that they had made it out alive. If you enjoyed this chapter of Unlikely Hero, Book 7 of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for Chapter 8. Don't forget to hit the like button or share this video with someone who you think might enjoy it. This helps me with the algorithms to grow my channel and is free and easy for you to do. Thank you and happy listening!